Welcome everybody. We are 40 now, but it seems the uh, number of attendances is still increasing, but uh, okay, we will start with some introduction. Uh, okay, my name is Nazareno Pierdic. I am from uh, University of Rome, La Sapienza, and uh, I am chairing uh, this uh, MIRS uh, Modeling Remote Sensing Technical Committee of uh, GLSS Society, uh, which as the name uh, is uh, telling us uh, is uh, focused uh, on the uh, electromagnetic modeling uh, uh, of the signal from different sensor in the microwave and uh, in the optical uh, uh, spectral regions. Today, uh, we have a webinar, very interesting one, from Professor Joel Johnson uh, from uh, Ohio State University, uh, who is a well-recognized scientist in this field, but in many other fields, uh, microwave radiometry, radio frequency interference, uh, and Joel, you can add, of course, uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, your presentation. And uh, I would like to ask Joel very much for being uh, available to be with this uh, webinar. Uh, the webinar will last for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we will have another 50 minutes, about 50 minutes, uh, uh, for uh, answering your question uh, or any other discussion uh, we want to have uh, uh, before the end of this webinar. Um, so I, I think that uh, probably, Joel, uh, I would like to, to you to, in, to start uh, doing your presentation. And uh, I again, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for this webinar that will be for sure very very interesting for everybody so joel the floor is yours okay thank you very much yeah i appreciate yeah, the to uh, present, present here. here let me share my screen um i believe everyone should see my screen now yes if you switch to full screen probably it would be even better okay okay fine all right. All right. And I think, Mauro, your uh, mic may still be open. We're getting an echo from you, it seems like. So, okay. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I'm Joel Johnson uh, from Ohio State. And uh, this being the Modeling and Remote Sensing Technical Committee, this seminar is about modeling and remote sensing, in particular about modeling rough surface scattering. And a kind of subtopic within that, this is kind of a talk for surface scattering enthusiasts like myself. So, um, Hopefully I can get across some of the uh, interesting things to uh, about one of the methods that's important in surface scattering involving the so-called Kirchhoff integral. This is work largely from this first paper here listed that's been published recently in TGAR. So if you have more, want to see more details, take a look at that. I won't be able to go through all the details. It's also work that was inspired by previous work from uh, Carl Warnick and his collaborators at Brigham Young from this second paper here. And I also note some uh, similar work ongoing in Italy with uh, Professor Iodici and many of his colleagues looking at similar issues that I also recommend that, that you're interested in this area to take a look at. So um, <clears throat> so the motivation here is uh, rough surface scattering, okay? And we know in the in the world of microwave remote sensing that scattering from remote from rough surfaces impacts a lot of our measurements. We're trying to measure that in many cases. You know, we have our synthetic aperture radars, our scatterometers, our altimeters, our measuring backscatterer from Earth's surface like the ocean, like land surface, like ice surface. Um, we also have these days reflectometry where we don't measure backscatter, we measure the specular scattering. You know, our incident wave comes and specularly scatters off the surface and we measure off here at the specular scattering angle or near specular in reflectometry. So we're also interested in that sort of scattering geometry. Surface scattering is just part of the picture. You know, we also have volume scattering. The two together determine the total observed response. But the surface scattering is an important part of that, and that's our focus today. Um, so you can see, the again, the illustration of our scattering process off a rough surface here. This second plot on the right is an illustration of the full bi-static scattering pattern from a surface. So for example, when our incident wave comes in here to the surface, it scatters all over the place, not just in the back scattering direction, not just in the forward scattering direction, but depending on surface roughness, can scatter in many directions. 
And so if we were to look at this picture from the top down, we would see that surface scattering energy going in all different directions. And uh, we're interested in understanding and modeling, you know, how much of it goes in a given direction as a function of things like frequency, scattering, geometry, surface roughness, polarization, and so on. And uh, in particular, I should also note that there's continuing growing interest, not in just near specular and backscattering, but also in more bistatic cases, you know, geometries that may be off at some angle here in this bistatic hemisphere and uh, trying to learn what we might could accomplish with remote sensing and those sorts of geometry. So, so throughout this talk, we'll be looking, trying to do methods that deal with the entire bistatic scattering geometry, not just backscattering or, or forward scattering. Okay, so that's our motivation. Um, you know, when we talk about scattering from Earth's surface, we don't know the detailed properties of the surface roughness. You know, we don't know exactly what the terrain profile is of the sea surface or the ocean surface or the land surface, for example. So we're gonna describe our surface roughness statistically. We're gonna model it as a stochastic process, okay? Because we don't know the exact surface profile in any measurement. That means that since we've got a statistical surface, that means the scattered fields, we also have to describe those statistically, okay? So there are random variables. You can talk about their probability density functions, or instead of talking about probability density functions, you can talk about moments like the mean uh, scat, the mean RCS, the normalized RCS in the case of a rough surface, or the coherent reflectivity. We'll be talking about these sort of uh, moments of the fields throughout this discussion, and uh, the amplitude and phase of those moments, you know, for the coherent part as a phase as well as an amplitude. Those are functions of the scattering geometry, the incident scatter polarization, the frequency, the permittivity, the surface roughness, lots of things. Um, so if we wanna model this, there's sort of three big picture ways of going about this. One is we try to do things numerically. In other words, we generate, you know, we kind of do like our radar measure, we do a synthetic radar measurement. We generate a particular realization of the surface, compute the scattering from that surface in whatever geometry we're interested in. And we might compute it numerically, like using method of moments or some numerical EM sort of tool. And then since the process is statistical, we have to do that simulation over and over and over again to deal with the statistics, which is called a Monte Carlo simulation. So that's one way of attacking these problems, but it's expensive because of having to do the Monte Carlo simulation and because of the expense of doing a fully numerical solution of actual equations. So in contrast to that, today I'm talking about analytical methods where we make some approximation of Maxwell equations so that we can analytically solve the problem and then analytically do the average without having to do a Monte Carlo simulation. So that's the kind of method I'm gonna be going into more detail today. I didn't list the empirical approaches as well. So empirical means you go out and make a lot of measurements and just curve fit the results, which is all three of these approaches are used these days in our studies of surface scattering, but I'm focused here on the analytical case, which can be very uh, computationally efficient, but, you know, may, we may lose some accuracy sometimes, and when we do that, it's important to understand what we're losing as we do it. Okay, so so again, in this presentation, I'm talking about analytical approaches and how to improve efficiency in computing the results of those. They're already efficient to begin with, but sometimes you want to be even more efficient, so this talk is about that. Some of the classical analytical approaches for surface scattering for predicting the mean incoherent RCS, which I'm labeling as uh, sigma here, the the average or the ensemble average normalized radar cross section of the surface represented by sigma here. There are some theories, for example, physical optics is an approximate theory, small slope approximation is an approximate theory, the first order of small slope approximation, and others as well that state that the uh, the the in our, the average in RCS is related to this expression written right here. Okay, so it's related to an integral. That integral is called the Kirchhoff integral. Okay. And if we look at this integral, we're gonna be talking a lot about this integral. So let's try and understand what it's saying or think about these terms in this integral a little bit. Um, it, what we have is that the average in RCS is an integration, okay, over space. This vector here means it's over a 2D space, which we can call X and Y, for example, okay? And in that integration, we have these quantities involving this thing called Q. Okay, see these Qs here, Qz, Q perpendicular, and so on. Um, Q is related to the scattering geometry we're trying to compute for. Okay, so let's take a look and look at this picture we've got here of our scattering geometry. The incident wave here exciting our surface is called K0. You can see it's propagating into our surface here. And then the scattered wave 
goes off in direction k. Okay, these are two vectors. This is the incident vectoroid vector of the incident wave. This is the scattered wave. Okay, and uh, those two are vectors. You can see we've tried to break them out in terms of their spherical coordinates here. For example, the incident wave comes in at azimuth angle phi i at polar angle theta i with respect to the normal to the surface. Okay, see those theta i and phi i. Scattered wave goes off in polar angle theta s, azimuth angle phi s. All right, so we've got this. those vectors give us our scattering geometry. Okay, theta i, phi i, theta s, phi s. But they don't show up in the Kirchhoff integral. What shows up is this vector called q. That's the difference of those two. Okay, the difference of the scattered and incident wave numbers. And if you work out a little, do a little vector of thinking about this, you can convince yourself that this Q vector is actually the bisects these two. Okay, so Q is the bisector of, of these two K, K0 and K vectors, all right? And uh, Q is another vector. And if we look at that vector, like the other two, we can represent it in terms of its polar angle, theta Q, and its azimuth angle, phi Q. Okay, so this vector Q has an amplitude and then has a direction. Direction is determined by those two angles, theta Q and phi Q. Okay, we can see the representation here of that vector in terms of its its angles, you know, using regular spherical coordinates here. And uh, we can see uh, the Q perpendicular is just the horizontal components of Q. Okay, horizontal here being X and Y, normal being Z. The normal being normal to the surface boundary. All right. So we'll be talking throughout this uh, discussion a lot in terms of theta Q, QZ. QZ is the vertical component of the Q vector, okay? And remember, Q is defining the scattering geometry for us. What's nice about the Kirchhoff integral is it actually doesn't care about theta I, phi I, theta S, phi S. It just cares about Q. So the scattering geometry simplifies in terms of a smaller number of parameters, this Q vector, all right? And if you think about it, let's see, if, if we have specular scattering, in other words, you know, the K0 and K have the same uh, horizontal components, then the Q vector will point straight up. So theta Q equals zero means specular scattering. If we have backscattering, you know, K, the scattered wave is going opposite the direction of the incident wave, then theta Q equals theta I. So again, this the Q vector encapsulates the, uh, the bistatic geometry. And by varying theta Q from like zero to 90, we can and uh, and phi q as well. We can capture the entire bistatic scattering hemisphere. All right, so so that's the geometry. We're, you know, it's nice to simplify the geometry in terms of this way. And then if we look at the thing we're integrating, let's see, we're integrating something here that looks like a Fourier transform. You know, e to the minus i q perpendicular dot r. That looks like Fourier transform between r and q perpendicular here, two D Fourier transform. Except the function we're Fourier transform. We think we're Fourier transform is here, it's actually, it's not a Fourier transform because as we vary Q perpendicular, these angles here, it turns out we're also varying this QZ. So it's not a Fourier transform because the function we're trans we think we're transforming is not independent of the, of the argument of the transform. So it's not a Fourier transform. It looks a little bit like when we have this oscillating function here. And then here we have these exponentially decaying functions, okay? And the way they depend on the space coordinate of the integral is through this function here called C, correlation function of the surface. And this parameter called H is the RMS height of the surface. Okay, the, the root mean square height of how rough is the surface. So uh, we'll talk more about C in a minute here. Before we do, this integral also, this, so this is the Kirchhoff integral. It also gets multiplied by some stuff out front. Okay, we talk pi is just a constant, we talk about QZ. This thing called K here is a so-called kernel function that depends on which of the approximate theories you're using, physical optics or small slope approximation or other, other theory. Um, this function is depends only on the scattering geometry and on the permittivity and the polarization, but it doesn't depend on surface roughness, okay? And it's a known function of those. So, in terms of evaluating the NRCS, this is kind of the easy part out here because it doesn't vary with roughness. We have analytical expressions for this. So we just, it's straightforward to compute. The thing that we're gonna be discussing is about computing this integral, okay? And this kernel out here, we call it K for physical optics. We call it B for small slope approximation, but it's a function, we know what it is. It depends on permittivity, depends on polarization, depends on the scattering geometry. It 
may depend on the scatter, the, the theta i, phi i, theta s, phi s. So it may be the expressible in terms of q or not expressible, depending on the method you're using. But again, we know what it is, so it's not uh, not the hard part of the problem. Okay, so so this is our sort of setup here. We're going to be talking about evaluating this integral. The c function is uh, you know what we're going to characterize the surface with. The surface roughness is characterized by the RMS height and this correlation function c. Okay, so our correlation function tells us on our stochastic process how is the roughness between points correlated as a function of distance. Okay, when uh, if I put the argument of c to zero, that means we have two points right on top of each other. They're perfectly correlated, so c at zero is one. And then as we make r larger, we're talking about the correlation between points separated by more distance, so it should be a decaying function of distance. The Fourier transform of the correlation function is we're going to call W. That's the power spectral density of the surface that represents how the how the energy you could say of the surface roughness is distributed amongst different link scales uh, defined by this wave number of spatial frequency called K. All right, so that that's how we represent our surface roughness. Depending on the type of surface we have, we would vary these. The ocean surface has a different power spectrum than the Gaussian surface or or other surface models. Uh, both. Let's see, C is a unitless quantity, it's a correlation. Uh, but from looking at these integrals, we can see that the power spectral density is not unitless. It has units of meters to the fourth. So there's a unitless quantity called the curvature spectrum that is unitless. That's take the wave number to the fourth power times the power spectral density. That's um, that's a unitless way of representing the surface roughness. And uh, throughout this discussion, I'm going to be trying to uh, cast things in terms of unitless quantities that reveal some of the more general physics rather than being stuck with units all the time, kind of a more mathematician sort of approach. Um, and in particular, one one thing we can do there is we can take these this link scale here in the correlation function and these wave numbers that we're integrating over and kind of scale those out to make them unitless. In particular, for ocean surface-like models, there's a sort of maximum wave, maximum ocean wave length for a given wind speed that corresponds to the so-called peak wave number kappa. So if we scale our link scales in terms of that peak wave number kappa, then we can get some more unitless uh, representations of the correlation function in the curvature spectrum as shown here. Um, again, there's still Fourier transforms with each other. And if we, uh, some of my discussions are gonna emphasize ocean surface cases. So if we're thinking about ocean surface models that are driven by winds, you know, these, these, the correlation function is a two-dimensional function, depends on x and y. And so in addition to how it decays with range, we have to worry about how it varies in azimuth, how it varies with angle, with rotation angle. And for wind-driven models, it's a fairly standard assumption that the those spectra, the power spectral density, has a part that's constant in azimuth angle, and then it has a part that varies as the cosine of two times the azimuth angle, as shown here. And uh, with that sort of representation, then the correlation function also varies in a similar way. It has a part that's constant in azimuth and a part that varies as two times the azimuth angle. All right, so, so that's kind of what, when you see C or W, those are talking about how do we model the roughness of the surface. I should point out, this is under a stationary Gaussian random process model of surface roughness. That is not the only model you could use. It's a fairly standard and widely used model, it has a lot of nice properties. You know, we know that real services sometimes are are not the, perfectly described by this model, but this is a good starting point for many uh, factors in rough surface scatter. Okay, so so again, here's our integral we're trying to compute. Now we sort of understand what the C function is here. That's what determines how the surface roughness behaves in addition to the RMS side here. And so as we change to different surface models, we're going to get it, you know, the integral may behave differently. So if we think about how do we evaluate this integral? It can be, you know, it's, it's a, just an integral. You can do it numerically, put a lot of points. You can numerically integrate the thing. But, uh, you know, that doesn't give us much physical insight. And also this integral can be a little bit challenging sometimes because it combines both an oscillation, an oscillatory function, and an exponentially decaying function together. And depending on how fast this oscillates and how fast this decays, the integral may be more or less difficult to do. So um, in particular, we can see when the, if QZ times the RMS height, in other words, if the surface is rough compared to the wavelength, then this exponent is rapidly decaying. 
And this integral is going to be dominated by the function near the origin. It's going to rapidly decay from there. And that leads, that insight helps us formulate what's called the traditional geometrical optics approximation, the geo approximation to the Kirchhoff integral. Okay. But that geo approximation isn't perfect. And especially if you move, if theta Q, as you move off of uh, specular scattering, this, this oscillation becomes, you know, the interaction between the exponential decay and oscillation gets a little more complicated and geo doesn't work so well. So we have to think about how do we manage that. If the surface height is small compared to the wavelength, then we can expand this exponent in a power series and we get that the, the Kirchhoff integral can be represented as a power, you know, a sum of terms where each one is a Fourier transform of the correlation function to the nth power. That's another approximation we can make, a small height expansion. Um, again, numerically evaluating this for large QZH non-specular geometries, and in particular when we have multi-scale roughness, gets complicated because uh, you know, you have to put a lot of points in that integral and you're never quite sure how many you actually need. So, you know, and again, it doesn't give you much physical insight. So again, these in this talk, we're going to be looking at multiple approximations to the Kirchhoff integral. And again, these are described in more detail in the paper I cited. So, so the first one, again, geometrical optics, very uh, well-known approximation of this integral, which is under the assumption that this product, QZH, is large. So the exponential rapidly decays. And in that limit, you do a stationary phase evaluation of this integral, and you get this result, that the uh, RCS is proportional to 1 over the so-called mean square slope of the surface. And then it has an exponential uh, decay as you move off specular, given by this form here. This is well-known geometrical optics approximation. can work very well for near specular. It's very simple. It's great. You know, in GNSSR and in, in reflectometry, we use a lot this uh, approximation. But uh, it does have its limitations, especially as you move away from specular. So that's our first approximation we'll be talking about. As I mentioned, if the if QZH is small, we can expand this in a power series. And then uh, the NRCS is expressed as a sum of Fourier transform of the correlation function to the nth power. And, uh, you know, you'll need more terms in that series to get it to converge as the RMS height compared to wavelength gets larger. So that's a useful approach if the RMS height to wavelength is small. Uh, yet another approximation is the so-called classical two-scale approximation of, uh, of the ocean surface scattering or multi-scale surface scattering, where we take the correlation function here and we break it into a piece that comes from so-called long waves, long scale roughness of the surface, and a piece that comes from so-called short scale roughness of the surface. And if you do that, you find out you get the two-scale approximation that uh, the NRCS has a geo piece and a tilted small scale sort of piece. Um, but what's undesirable about that is you have to choose what's a long wave and what's a short wave. There's this requirement to have an ad hoc choice of a so-called cutoff link scale to separate long and short waves. That's actually also required in the geo theory. So if some of the discussions, some of these interests in other methods is trying to get around this need for this cutoff wave number in, in evaluating these things. And then finally, there's one more recent approximation. The, all these are classical methods that have been known a long time. The more recent one is called the stable PDF approximation where um, based on this uh, series expansion, you know, we get Fourier transform with a correlation function to the nth power. We can interpret that as a um, as being related to the, uh, the characteristic function of a so-called stable random variable. And I'll say a little bit more about that. It's a newer approximation. It's basically an improvement on the geo where you don't have to have a cutoff selection and it does better than the geo in general. So, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, don't have time to get into the details of all these. See the paper for more. Um, this, if we take this sea surface model that we introduced back here, okay, we think about a surface that has a correlation function like this and plug that into the Kirchhoff integral. Then we can simplify this integral a little bit for that kind of surface scattering model. And here's some details of that kind of complicated stuff here. But uh, the point of that is that if you introduce that model, then the NRCS turns out to be expressible as a sum of so-called azimuthal harmonics. In other words, we can uh, take the, if we have a surface who that varies with azimuth, okay, like on the ocean surface, you know, the wind direction blows one way, the surface looks different along the wind direction versus across the wind direction. If we have a surface like that, then we expect our scattered fields to vary with azimuth. You know, because we some some angles line up with the 
crests of the waves and some angles don't. So for that type of surface model, we indeed get that the NRCS is a sum of a bunch of even harmonics of that phi q azimuth dependence. Okay, so, so the point is we can take out the azimuth dependence of the scattering and just express it in terms of these so-called azimuth harmonics. When I talk about sigma zero, that will mean zeroth harmonic. In other words, if you averaged your scattering over azimuth rotation, second harmonic would be the result, you know, would have a, a second harmonic cosine variation and so on. Okay, so we'll talk some, of, we'll see some of these harmonics showing up. Um, in addition to that, the results I'm going to about to show here will be expressed in terms of these unitless quantities that I'm trying to emphasize. Okay, so instead of plotting things versus wind speed or versus RMS height, I'm going to plot them versus this unitless parameter QZ times H because that's what dominates the Kirchhoff integral, right? That's the roughness shows up as this QZ times H parameter and the theta Q parameter. These two parameters I'm going to plot things in terms of. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and start looking at some results, okay? Just to get, get a little bit more real here. So, so here's an example of some results for an ocean-like model, the Alpha Haley sea surface model, okay? Which is, uh, does have this directional dependence. Putting in wind speed 20 meters a second, you know, we could put whatever wind speed we wanted. Um, these are plots of that zeroth harmonic and second harmonic for the NRCS except I'm dividing out some of this stuff out in front, okay? Again, this is the easy part. Let's not worry about that. Let's focus on the Kirchhoff integral part. So I'm gonna divide the NRCS by this stuff that's already well known. Okay, so we have our zeroth harmonic, second azimuthal harmonic over here. And these are color plots, okay? It's a dB scale from about minus 40 dB to about 30, okay? And the vertical axis is our roughness parameter, QZ times H, our unitless roughness parameter where small values of that, 0.1, mean it's a very, almost flat surface. Huge values of that mean it's a very rough surface. So we got a log variation from 0.1 to 1,000, four orders of magnitude of roughness over here. And over here, we've got our theta Q angle going from zero out to 80 degrees. Again, theta means specular scattering. Zero, zero means specular scattering. And as we move off, we're going more non-specular. Okay? So looking at the, and these were just, these plots were generated by numerically evaluating the Kirchhoff angle. So what we see here is that, you know, near specular, definitely we have a lot of dependence on roughness. The uh, the incoherent NRCS is very small for small roughness, increases rapidly, gets to some peak up here, and then starts to gradually fall decay as we go to larger roughness. But it's a fairly smooth decay for even for huge change in roughness. Whereas if we're out here at larger angles, things in general are more smooth, much less sensitive to roughness. Okay. Similar results for the second harmonic, except the second harmonic vanishes at normal incidence. So, or vanishes for specular scattering, rather. So, so you can see that over here. Um, you know, these color plots are nice. You know, this this is spanning kind of the entire all bistatic scattering angles, all uh, frequencies. You know, the way we presented this. So that's it's sort of a universal plot of the results here for this particular sea surface case. Um, we can take some cuts out of this to get a little bit more insight. So here, for example, is the zeroth harmonic cut at specular scattering in this lower plot, okay? So again, for specular scattering, we have small, in our, this is versus roughness, okay? It's specular scattering. So for small roughness, we have small incoherent scattering, comes up, peaks somewhere, and then gradually decays. And one of the themes of this talk is about looking at how these different approximations do. So the solid blue curve here is the numerically computed one that took a lot of fooling around with and a lot of points and so on to get it to work right. Um, and we can see, for example, here's a small height approximation in these red X's doing very well for small values of, of uh, QZH, but then not doing so well once that gets too large. This is our so-called stable PDF approximation over here. We can see that's doing very well for once QZH becomes greater than about five or six, that pretty much does extremely well past that point. So part of our discussion is, you know, can we get an approximation anywhere in this plane? Are there places we can't get an approximation? And then here's a cut versus angle, okay, in this plot. So in this case, we're going to this QZ equals 100 and, you know, the roughness parameter equals 100 and cutting across angle. And again, looking at the, the uh, stable PDF approximation doing very well near specular, okay, out to a fairly large uh, theta Q angle. And then we don't plot it after that because it doesn't do well after that point. And then here's our two scale tilted small scale part, which does very well for larger angles. 
Okay, so again, a general theme of this work is just trying to look at these different approximations of the Kirchhoff integral, seeing where they work, where they don't work. Can we get an approximation anywhere in the bi-static hemisphere? Um, and so these plots kind of focus on that. Okay, so here what we're doing is the same sort of plot here, roughness on one axis, non-specular angle on the other, and taking the difference between the numerically evaluated Kirchhoff integral and different approximations and plotting the difference of those on a 1 dB scale. Okay, so when this is blue means we have a good approximation. When it's yellow means we have a bad approximation. So the, the cases shown are the small height approximation with a single term here, small height approximation with two terms here. It turns out you need two terms in that to do well near specular, okay? And then here's the tilted small scale part of the two scale approximation. Here's the stable PDF part. Um, I didn't show you, know, you can make these for geo and for other methods as well. So looking at these, we can see that, um, you know, if I, if I look for, if I put all these together, does the, do I get blue somewhere throughout the entire plot? And the answer is almost, okay. We can see, for example, this tilted small scale part gets, does very well for almost, for large angles, almost everywhere. Okay. So this part of the curve, we almost got everywhere. So we just need to worry about this close to specular part. For close to specular, we do pretty well with our stable PDF uh, approximation, but and we do pretty well also with our two-term series, but there is, depending on how precise you want to be, there can be a little bit of a gap for QZH, like between one and five, say, where we don't have a perfect uh, approximation. We may need to still do some numerical things there, but fortunately in that part of the space, the numerical integral isn't bad. You know, it behaves pretty well. So, uh, so that's one of the results shown in the paper. Um, the paper also talks some about, you know, that was for that Elfle Haiti model where we had a variation with azimuth. Okay. The paper also looks at this case, well, what if you neglected the variation with azimuth? You know, which for the ocean surface, you probably, that's definitely a, an approximation. But if you had some application where you weren't so worried about variations with azimuth and you approximated the ocean surface as being isotropic, okay, not varying with azimuth, and you used uh, an ocean surface model called the Pearson Moskowitz surface model then you can further simplify things a lot for this particular case. Okay, the, the pearson moskowitz surface model is nice because the only dependence on wind speed, the only parameter it has is uh, this, cut, this uh, large wavelength, you know, the maximum size of the longest ocean wave called the peak wave number, which we've already factored out. So actually, once you factor that out, the pearson moskowitz surface is just a fixed spectrum once and for all. Um, you know, it does... I haven't talked about this much so far, but you know, I mentioned in the geo approximation, we have to compute the MSS, which is related to the slope, the RMS slope of the surface. For a lot of these sea surface models, that doesn't converge. You know, if you let the sea's waves go out to infinitely small, then the surface slopes go to infinity. It doesn't converge. So that's again, that's the reason why we need this so-called cutoff link scale in the geo to make it work for, for ocean-like surfaces. Um, we can also get a nice approximation of the color correlation function for the pearson moskowitz case. We can get a simpler form of the Kirchhoff integral. And it turns out, you know, for an isotropic pearson moskowitz surface, we can basically solve the problem once and forever in terms of these two parameters, QZH and theta Q. Once you've computed that table, there's no, you're done for, for any frequency, any scattering geometry, any wind speed. You know, you solve the problem once and for all. Um, so, uh, Similar kind of plots here for the pearson moskowitz spectrum. Here's it only has a zeroth harmonic because it's isotropic. You know, it's constant in azimuth. Here's that similar plot for the pearson moskowitz case. And uh, again, looking at a few more cuts here. These are cuts versus roughness at different non-specular angles. Okay, so here's the specular one. Looks similar to what we saw before. As we move off specular, we see different sorts of behaviors in that uh, Kirchhoff integral again. For large non-specular cases, it's fairly independent of roughness. It's dominated by small scale roughness. So uh, there's not much impact of the roughness out here at these large specular angles, non-specular angles. Here's a plot uh, versus theta Q. Let's see, for varying, you know, taking different cuts across uh, theta Q for different values of roughness, okay? For very small roughness, we have this sort of gap region near specular, okay? that then fills in as the surface becomes rougher. We get to a peak and then we come down gradually in this more sort of uh, geometrical optics regime here. And here's 
taking that same plot and looking at how things change from the value at uh, at, at very for a very rough surface. So you know you can get a lot of information out of these. Um, we can derive a fully analytical expression for the so-called stable PDF form for the pearson moskowitz surface. We get similar kinds of overlap regions in terms of our different approximations. Um, here's also take, taking a look in detail at the, the so-called stable PDF version, again, the one that's an improvement upon GEO, and comparing that with what we would have gotten from GEO. And again, you can see, this is the errors again, right? Blue means good, yellow means bad. You can see that the stable PDF indeed significantly extends the non-specular angle extent of our high frequency approximation, you could say, okay? Geo still does well. I mean, definitely when we can use Geo and we have confidence in it, it's great to use, but the stable PDF does give us some improvements upon Geo. Here's a cut here showing the comparison of the two. The uh, numerical in this plot are the Xs. This is versus versus angle here, okay? So we can see the numerical, the, like any uh, multi-scale surface, we have sort of a gradual fall off in RCS as we move off specular, the thin sort of goes into this plateau region where the small scale roughness starts becoming important. And the geo approximation doesn't capture that small scale effect, whereas a stable PDF can partially capture it. So, yeah, definitely when it's available to a stable PDF approximation can be an improvement upon geo. Close to specular, they pretty much agree with each other. So if you're, if you're only working close to specular, you know, geo remains fine, although you still have this question of what's the cutoff wave number I should use in evaluating the MSS that goes into the geo? Okay, so again, when we're near specular, for example, you know, a lot of GNSSR, L-band stuff, we're interested in near specular cross sections. We know at specular, we just have the reflection coefficient over the MSS, okay? SX and SY here mean the RMS slope of the rough surface in the up and crosswind directions. This product down here is called the MSS, mean square slope of the surface. Um, when we use the geo, we have to compute these. We have to know what is the RMS slope of the surface. And we evaluate that for a given surface spectrum model by integrating over the spectrum. Integrating, you know, here's, here's the, it's, it's, the slope variances are moments of the power spectral density. So here's how we compute those. We do these integrals here, okay? But when we do those integrals, again, we have to stop somewhere. We, we take, say, you know, we only care about the, MSS of the so-called long waves. So we truncate this integral at some cutoff wave number that corresponds to the length scale of those long waves. We only include the slopes coming from the long waves. So we still have this problem of how do we choose this cutoff wave number? Cygnus chooses it as, uh, you know, has a way of choosing it as kind of an ad hoc method. But um, this stable PDF also gives us some insight into that. Okay, here's a little bit more on the stable PDF approximation. Probably uh, not, you know, it's based on a different approximation of the correlation function near the origin than what's used in standard geo. And it turns out, it shows you that the Kirchhoff integral is related to, can be cast into a form that's related to the central limit theorem for random variables that have infinite variance. Okay, so it's a little bit, the connection's a little strange, you know, it takes some looking at the mathematics to convince yourself of this. But once you do, um, the Kirchhoff integral can be interpreted in terms of the central limit theorem for random variables having infinite variance. Okay. So, you know, the central limit theorem tells us that, you know, if I have the PDF of a random variable that's a sum of a lot of random variables, then typically that PDF goes to Gaussian. The PDF of a sum over a lot of random variables typically is going to be Gaussian. And if that's the case, you get the standard geo approximation. The geo approximation gives us this Gaussian behavior. But if you have surfaces whose slope variance is infinite as you extend the cutoff, then you have to go to the central limit theorem for infinite variance random variables, which is a different central limit theorem. It involves these so-called symmetric alpha stable random variables. And so you can connect our interest in multi-scale surface scattering to central limit theorem of uh, infinite random, you know, infinite variance random variables, kind of an interesting connection. And out of that, that, that theory turns out it shows you how you should choose the cutoff wave number. It actually has some mathematics that says you should choose the cutoff wave number for your uh, geo theory to satisfy this equation. It gets rid of this ad hoc nature and tells you how to choose that cutoff wave number. 
which is an interesting connection between the those two theories. So this is a plot showing what that uh, what that stable PDF interpretation tells you how to choose this cutoff wave number. Okay, and in the past, typically we would choose the cutoff wave number just to be a constant, like we say it's uh, you know it's the electromagnetic wave number over two or over three or something, or maybe we put cos theta in there or something. But this uh, stable PDF tells you that actually that cutoff wave number should depend on the surface spectrum. And it shows you how to figure out what it is given a particular spectrum. And this is a plot of what it is for the alpha heavy spectrum as a function of wind speed. Again, in terms of this QZH sort of parameter, we can see that that cutoff, instead of saying it's QZH over seven, like Cygnus does, it could be somewhere between 20 and, and four, depending on the service profile. So it's kind of interesting to, uh, to find that out. And then we can compare geo predictions using sort of our standard assumption for a fixed cutoff versus using it with this more fancy cutoff labeled here as warning geo. So the comparison here is the specular in RCS versus wind speed at L band. For the blue curve is the numerically computed PO. The black curve is sort of our standard geo with a fixed cutoff wave number. And the red one is our stable PDF cutoff wave. And we can see that it improves upon the traditional geo. So that, Again, we can convince the stable PDF gives us some nice insights into this sort of process. Here's another one showing a similar result. The stable PDF version does better than the traditional geo. These are some plots comparing geo and PO. For uh, This is for the standard geo, and this is for the, the stable PDF version. Again, looking at errors here. So blue means good versus incidence angle and wind speed. Yellow means bad. So the stable PDF way of choosing the cutoff wave number does improve upon geo. Standard geo is not bad, of course. You know, we already know it works pretty well, but these are improvements we can find. And in particular, as we move further off specular, then the stable PDF uh, approximation can be very useful. All right, so that's a quick overview of some of these results. You know, again, we're talking about approximations to computing the Kirchhoff integral. There's an approximation that's almost always available, small height approximations if a service is fairly flat. Stable PDF, if it's rougher and you have larger uh, non-specular angles, you can use traditional geo if you're near specular, you might want to use this improved cutoff wave number that the stable PDF tells you to use. Tilted small scale works very well for large uh, non-specular angles. Um, so putting all those together, we can get some good approximations of the Kirchhoff integral and also get some physical insight into what sort of effects are influencing our surface scattering, which could help us think about how to design future observing systems for, for measuring particular properties of web surfaces. All right, so I think that's it. I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Very interesting. And at the beginning, you explained basically everything about roughness with just one integral <laughs> and the different possible approximation. Uh, OK, uh, we can, uh, you can, everyone can make question, of course, or comment. I think there were already a couple of uh, message on the chat. Uh, okay, one uh, uh, is about, uh, is asking uh, whether the K0 and K uh, are NQ are coplanar vector. This I was referring at, at uh, just the first slide with the general uh, geometric uh, description of the problem. Yes. Uh, are they coplanar? The answer is no. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, any two vectors will define a plane, right? So these two will lie in some plane, but that plane may not be very well aligned with the surface, you know, the surface normal. Or, you know, so, so I think, you know, all these are 3D vectors, yes, in, in, the, in this plane, in this picture. Uh, yes, but the Q vector uh, is uh, coplanar with the K0 the incidence and the scattering, probably. Yes, yes. Q will lie on the plane of K0 and K, yes. Okay. Uh, I think that probably this was the question uh, by Wai Chung, but okay, in case you need more explanation by Chung. Okay, okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, okay. Uh, the question is, what is meant when you talk about uh, roughness uh, independence uh, on... Uh, a Q zeta H. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's an H is the, the roughness standard deviation. 
Okay, yes. please enjoy. Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, when we when we evaluate this, when we think about the scattering, when we start off thinking about the scattering problem, there's a lot of parameters. There's frequency, polarization, scattering geometry. There's a RMS height of surface. So a lot of parameters that, you know, it, it may seem like they're unrelated to each other. But the Kirchhoff integral is telling us that uh, many of those parameters can be boiled down in terms of this single one, QZH, because that's what shows up in the integral. Which QZH then you can see is a mixture of frequency because Q in, you know, includes the EM wave numbers, which have frequency in there. It's a combination of frequency, scattering geometry, because the Z component has, has this theta Q angle, and the RMS height of the surface. It's a unitless parameter because Q has units of wave number, and RMS height has units of meters. So when you multiply those two, you get a unitless parameter. And uh, so it's, you know, it's a unitless parameter that captures many of the essential impacts of surface roughness in the, in the Kirchhoff integral. And so it's good to look at our results in terms of that parameter instead of these multiple bunch of parameters that went into that to that one that really mattered. So that's why we look at our results in terms of QZH. Now we should remember when we look at these results, you know, QZ, like as I vary theta Q here, as I move along this theta Q axis, in reality, for a given scattering problem, I would also probably be varying QZH. You know, so we, we've sort of taken one representation of the surface scattering problem in terms of all of its original parameters and represented it in terms of a smaller mathematical set, you, should, you could say. But then a given, you know, we have to always map whatever whatever real scattering problem we have into this into this representation. And for example, changing theta Q may actually move us along a sloped line in this plot rather than along a horizontal line because QZ could vary with theta Q as well. Uh, okay, thanks, Joel. Another question is uh, NRCC, I think, and SC, probably NRCS. I don't know, is a rough parameter. Maybe use the Doppler spectrum for estimation of quality of models. Uh, Joel, have you understood the question? Yes, yes, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Certainly, you know, when we do surface scattering observations, we're interested in many parameters, not just the average NRCS. We might be interested in the top spectrum of the surface as well. And uh, yes, you can use analytical approaches to attempt to evaluate or estimate the top spectrum of the surface and similar comparisons of, you know, uh, numerical and uh, observed and analytically approximated top spectra are relevant. Um, so that's a point well taken, not really the subject of uh, this talk. Um, okay, thanks. Another question. Uh, how is this surface scattering equation correlated with the radiativity transfer equation? Also, can I integrate with the soil moisture estimation to remove the effect of sur surface roughness? Uh, okay, so probably uh, radiative transfer is more uh, related to the volume uh, propagation, but. Uh... Yes, yes, yeah. So certainly if we have a ready to transfer theory, which would be including, you know, we would might attempt to include both surface and volume scattering effects, modeling vegetation, for example. Um, the surface scattering part is a boundary condition in the ready to transfer equation. And um, it's, it's sort of not uncommon in our solutions of the ready to transfer equation that, you know, we, we want to, uh, we, we write the, the total scattering as a sum of a surface scattering part plus a volume scattering part plus this sort of interaction between the, the surface and volume that would come in the radio transfer equation through the boundary conditions. And many times we simplify the, the interaction part to assume the surface only specularly scatters rather than completely bistatically scatters like it actually does. And so some of the methods, you know, if we can do better at computing the full bistatic scattering pattern, we can examine some of those effects we may have neglected in the past in terms of the full bistatic coupling between uh, vegetation and surface scattering. That is complicated, but uh, you know, with if we can compute our bistatic scattering patterns efficiently, then we can have better chance of uh, evaluating those full RT theories. And as far as soil moisture, you know, again, if you have a full RT theory, then the surface scattering is part of that. Having the surface scattering, you know, we, we need to compensate or try and you know, get get rid of vegetation scattering effects to emphasize surface scattering, certainly uh, 
subject of interest in the soil moisture remote sensing community. Okay, so you answer to the question uh, about the soil moisture. There is another question asking uh, if uh, energy conservation uh, was uh, imposed in this solution. Yes, in yes. The, in the stable PDF formulation. Yes, oh, in the stable PDF formulation. Um, so, so I would say in terms of energy conservation, um, it's it, that's, pro that's probably more related to the to the particular version of the Kirchhoff integral. In other words, the particular model under which we're evaluating the Kirchhoff integral. So, physical optics, for example, would be one model. Physical optics does not convert conserve energy. The small slope approximation, which we change the kernel function here, would converge energy, conserve energy if we if we include higher order terms in the method, which are not shown here. So I would say that depends. You know, to for to to have this method conserve energy under the small slope approximation, we have to add another series term to uh, to capture that. So the stable PDF approximation would be one part of that, but then you would have to continue to the next order term of the small slope approximation. I think. Um, you know, certainly an interesting research topic would be to look at the stable PDF form of the next correction in the small slope approximation, which would then make it presumably conserve, have a better chance of conserving energy. So uh, that's a topic of interest that, uh, you know, I think someone should pursue. Uh, one more question uh, is asking uh, whether you have also considered in this comparison, the small slope approximation first and second order. And then uh, he's asking, what do you mean uh, uh, with the tilt slope? Okay. Um, yeah, the small slope. So the first order small slope approximation would be identical to everything here. We would just change this K kernel into B. And again, the, the emphasis of these plots is not the kernel function. We're trying to take that out. So it's just the, the Kirchhoff integral itself. So yes, these results would apply equally to the First order small slope approximation, we just then take these results and multiply them by the, the different kernel, which would be more polarization dependent than the, the, the physical optics and so on. Um, again, haven't done it for the next term in the small slope approximation. I think that'd be an interesting thing to do. Um, so I guess that's my, I think that was the question, right? Uh, yes, about the, um, yes, it seems uh, that this is the question. Uh, basically, in case this is not true, please. Uh, add something in the chat. Um, oh, then what do I mean by the tilt slope? Yes, there's a question there. Yeah, the tilt slope, yes, 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 right. Right, so if we if we take the, the physical optics integral and we write the correlation function as a sum of a long and a small, uh, long waves and short waves parts, um, and then we power series expand about the short wave part, we find out we get an integral you can interpret the result that, that you obtain in terms of a sort of convolution of the long wave part and the short wave part. And so that, that convolution is the sort of uh, tilted small scale uh, sort of uh, behavior that we have in the two scale approximation. It's not exactly the same because in the standard two scale approximation, the small scale part uses the SPM instead of the, uh, just the Kirchhoff integral by itself. So and we do some polarization projections and so on. So, so this doesn't quite capture the full tilted small scale part of the two scale model, but it it's basically has a term that's similar to that. And, and, and there's a cutoff wave number required in doing that. When, when I show the tilted small scale results, I am, uh, when I do this comparison here, for example, there is a cutoff wave number assumed in computing the uh, tilted small scale parts that described in more detail in the paper. So that's what we mean by that. Uh, someone is asking you show again uh, the reference to the paper uh, that was one of the first slide. Yep, this one, yeah. Okay. It just came and out. Then, may, I think it hasn't been, you know, I think it still may not, it may still be a preprint. Okay, then uh, someone is also asking uh, whether this uh, uh, presentation will be made available. Uh, and. The, the, the recorded version, I mean, if I would say, I think this is, uh, if Joel may agree, this uh, will be made available uh, uh, in some time uh, for uh, people that was not able to attend, uh, yes. I think. I, I think uh, that's fine, yes. And then uh, another question uh, um, is uh, asking, uh, 
if you consider the cases for scattering into the lower medium. Um, we, those, those weren't explicitly examined here, but the, uh, the expressions are similar for that case. You know, you'd have a different wave number and so on, but uh, it can, the similar, I, I think similar approximations would apply. Although, you know, if we start having lossy media, then there may be some differences in thinking about this approximation that would be an interesting thing to think about as well. Also a question, Joel, if you have never tried to consider uh, as for the spectra and, uh, and um, autocorrelation function uh, cases of uh, that can represent uh, the non-isotropy of uh, uh, terrain instead of the uh, sea surface. Um, yeah, that, this paper focuses on this, this model, um, you know, Certainly, the, you know, the general Kirchhoff integral is always available. Many of the approximations I talked about can be made to the Kirchhoff integral in its original form. So, uh, so, so many of these uh, further simplifications were were about you know trying to make it more analytically easy to see what was happening. But a, a lot of the physics we're talking about here still holds in the original form, for which you could put whatever variation with azimuth you wanted, as long as it's uh, you know represents a stationary Gaussian random process. Okay, yes. Uh, so I don't know uh, if there are any more questions or questions that uh, I have skipped for some reason. Uh, uh, we have someone who raised uh, his hand. I will just allow him to talk, okay? Alexander? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So I just want to mention uh, one advantage of the splitting of the dependency of the Kirchhoff integral in terms of the QZ and Q perpendicular. If in case if you have a variety, let's say experimental measurements of the uh, scattering cross section for a variety of Qs, then you uh, you can select the subset of the of the, your data with the, which correspond to the fixed QZ and varying Q uh, perpendicular. In this case, this effective spectrum, uh, what we see on this slide in parentheses, becomes a constant. And you can uh, use the inverse Fourier transform for your subset and infer the uh, relation function as a result to solve inverse problem. Of course, right. it might be uh, difficult to get uh, such a broad variety of data, but just in case, if you have such a, an advantage, then you can try to use this technique to, I mean, the splitting of the Kirchhoff integral dependency in terms of QZ and Q perpendicular to solve the inverse problem. That's, one that's, that's a great point. Oh, yeah, it's very interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I should, uh, for those of you who aren't aware on the call, you know, uh, Dr. Voronovich, who just asked the question, is the originator of the small slope approximation. So, so uh, yes, yeah. that's a very interesting uh, point. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, probably it seems there are not uh, additional questions. Fayuts, uh, can you confirm? Because I'm lost in with the two different window with the questions. <laughs> Um, uh, there is one last question, I think. Okay, uh, yes, yes, yes. Can you please elaborate uh, how surface roughness varies with the frequency? I mean, probably the response from the surface roughness uh, varies with frequency. Uh, Joy, can you see the question in the chat? Yes, yes. Um, I think, uh, you know, in general, when we have uh, scattering from a rough surface, Certainly, the uh, properties of the scattered scattering that we get depend very much on the RMS height, the roughness of the surface, which is often, you know, you know, in terms of a single parameter, we would say the RMS height is the leading parameter. That, compared to the wavelength, is what determines is the surface more, does it look more flat or does it look more rough? So for a given surface, you know, has a certain RMS height, as you vary the frequency, at very low frequencies, that surface may look electromagnetically flat, we would say, and scatter like a, almost like a mirror. Whereas at much higher frequencies where the RMS height is large compared to the wavelength, the surface becomes much more a uh, scattering medium sending energy into many directions. So that's why, you know, this QZH parameter kind of captures that effect. 
you know, when, when the RMS height is small compared to the wavelength, then QZH will be small. It's almost a flat surface. When the RMS height is large compared to the wavelength, then QZH will be large, much rougher surface. So that's why this QZH parameter can be useful, although the, the scattered geometry also influences that. So that's why this QZH parameter is kind of a, a useful parameter for thinking about, is this surface going to look fairly flat at this frequency or is it going to look more rough? It's also related to the so-called Rayleigh parameter of the surface scattering. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think okay. there was one more question about seafoam, which, uh, yes, seafoam is not- Ah, included. yes, yes, you're right, sorry. Yeah, we're not including sorry, the effects of foam. This is just for the surface with no foam coverage. Uh, including foam, you know, there are various approximations for that. One way is to describe the surface as a layered medium. Um, if it's just a layered medium with roughness, uh, and the you know if it's just a coating of the surface itself, then you know in some cases we maybe could get away with just modifying the permittivity or putting a layered reflection coefficient or something. But uh, if it's more complicated than that, this expression doesn't. We're not we're not worried about that contribution in this discussion. Uh, okay, so uh, I think we are discussing uh, since one hour exactly as in our plan, uh, so uh, probably we can close here if there are not other questions or comments, uh, but uh, I cannot see other uh, questions in the chat or uh, in the other window. So, uh, Joel, uh, I would like to ask to thank you very much again. I think there was a, a lot of interest, a lot of questions uh, because the uh, the presentation was very, very full of information and concept. And uh, thank you again. I hope to see you very soon. And also most of the people that I see uh, in the list of uh, participants. And I say goodbye to all the people that uh, we have met uh, in the past and also to the people that are new uh, to this webinar. Thank you all of, all of you for attending the webinar. and. Uh, Feyruz for supporting us, and of course, Joel for giving the interesting presentation.